So Alberto, uh, we would remember you as a guy who wrote this paper on GoaNet and Goans in cyberspace. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? That was it. Um, actually, out of convenience, because you know, as an anthropologist, uh, my interest was to go out to conduct uh, ethnographic work. Yeah. And just about that time, uh, someone suggested that why don't you conduct, you know, uh, an ethnography of Goans. Yeah. But because of the, you know, the time, uh, the sort of limited time, I was unable to, you know, to conduct a proper yeah. ethnographic work in Goa. And around that time, uh, there was an interest in cyber culture and I read you know several books about you know, uh, the cyber world and various kinds of cyber communities and I decided that uh, why not you know do a search and see what was available in Goa. It's quite rare in that sense to to write on a cyber community in its early stages. Yes I know it was rare and I became uh, you know renowned for a very short period of time during that, that period because uh, you know, I received some media attention in, in Australia too. In Australia too? too. Yeah. I and see. Uh, I was interviewed. And, I see. And in fact, there was a documentary that was made about uh, the computers. And there was a very short, sort of 30 seconds, I think, and that, you know, about my work in I the see. documentary. And um, they had, you know, they interviewed people like Bill Gates and I see. <laughs> various, you know renowned uh, people in, in the computer field and then there was me, you know, uh, Dr. Alberto Gomez from La Trobe University, I see. who is, you know, uh, researching on, on, on Goans in cyberspace. So you've uh, been a Malaysian Goan in that sense, born and brought up in Malaysia for how many generations? Um, well, I'm the first generation. Uh, my parents, uh, you know, are from Divar yeah. in Goa and then um, my... They migrated? Yeah. My... It was actually my father who joined his, my grandfather. They moved to what was called Singapore at that time. Okay. My, my grandfather was a classical, you know, Western classical musician, okay. a violinist, and then subsequently my, my father took up music. And, and the Gomez family uh, were instrumental in establishing, you know, and they were instrumental in establishing, uh, you know, Western classical music. This is in Singapore or Malaysia today? Well, Malaysia? subsequently they moved from Singapore to Kuala Lumpur. I see. And my grandfather was the person who set up the first music school and music uh, instrument shop. In which year? Uh, this must have been in the sort of early 1900s, sort oh, of wow. 1910, 1920, I see. possibly around that time. But my father then, um, you know, followed his father's footsteps, uh, but focused on piano rather than the violin. I see. And his younger brother, you know, played the violin, and they, the two of them, you know, they were, you know, um, very good uh, musicians see. and up to sort of. What play. were their names? Uh, my father, Joao Gomez. My um, uncle is Francisco Gomez. Francis Gomez. So you subsequently migrated to Australia, that's... That's right. That's where that you are now. That was much later, yeah. That in the 80s in, or 90s? Uh, 89, I moved. I studied in Australia. I see. In the early 80s. You did your PhD at the Australian Australia National, National University. Right. And then from, from Australia, I returned to Malaysia. I was already a, a university academic in a local university, University of Malaya I see. in Malaysia. I so I was on leave to do my PhD. Okay. So I returned um, for two or three years uh, back yeah. to University of Malaya, and then decided to move, you know, to Australia. And now you're a professor at at the uh, La Trobe, um, La Trobe University in Melbourne. In Melbourne. I've okay. been there since uh, 1990. What does your work focus on mostly? In well, um, I teach. Um, I do research, but most yeah. of my teaching is focused on generic courses, so I teach a first year anthropology. Yeah. But the I've, research side, I mean? Oh, research side. Um, most of my work has been on Malaysian Aboriginal people. Yeah. I've, um, you know, authored uh, three books focusing on developmental implications, you know, focusing yeah. on the impact of capitalism yeah. in uh, Malaysian Aboriginal villages. I see. 
But in terms of teaching, um, it's mainly on generic courses, focusing on development studies, and I teach an introductory anthropology course that possibly has the highest enrollment in Australia, about 700 students. Really? Yeah. And as far as Goa is concerned, what's your writing focused on so far? So far it has been on cultural identities. I'm particularly interested in um, how to go and sort of construct their identities. And, uh, I'm you know, interested in... I mean, some time ago I read, you know, Caroline Lefeka's um, paper on Goa Indica, and I've been, you know, quite interested in some of the kinds of the paradoxes, you know, about Goan identities. So when I wrote a paper uh, for the newspapers, the Herald, which was published, I think, in the 1990s, and the paper is entitled "Growing Up to Be Goan." Yeah. And in that paper, sorry, not in the 1990s, it was published 2000. in. 2003. Three, three, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and in that paper, what I did was I, uh, you know, explored uh, the construction of my identity as a goer. Yeah, yeah. And um, what I was, you know, particularly interested in is, is how the diasporic goer identity is um, imagined in, in many ways. You know through a certain kind of connection with the homeland. It's quite but a complex issue in that sense. It is very complex and and in many ways it was trying to come to terms with the lies, you know, I've been told uh, <laughs> as a young boy in Malaysia. You like know, what? Things like um, majority of the Goans are Christian, yeah. you know, uh, that uh, to be, you know, to be referred to as a kunbi was derogatory, yeah, you know, yeah. so when my room was untidy, you know, my mum would say to me, you know, what's happened to you? How come your room is so untidy? You're living like a kunbi, you know, so <laughs> those sorts of things. And yeah. then when I began to learn a bit more about Goa, I, see. I confronted my mother and I said, well, years ago you used to call me Kokno and kunbi, and, and in fact now I'm really quite proud of, you know, yeah. those... Uh, Labels. They labels, yeah, precisely. Yes. And uh, in terms of the research on Goa, what do you feel about work being done here currently? Are you keeping in touch with it? I am keeping in touch. Uh, I think the work is really very good. Uh, but one of the things that I'm you know, really interested in, which is uh, a logical extension of my work on Aborigines in Malaysia and yeah. you know, tribal communities in general, is uh, focused on you know, research on tribal communities and uh, uh, knowing more about you know Goan Adivasis and so this is one of the areas that I would like to see much greater sort of interest and growth and you know perhaps you know development in terms of, of understanding and I've been talking to a number of you know um, leaders of, of such communities yeah. um, you know, pointing out the, the the necessity and also you know the tremendous importance of having more you know information about them and the last several years I've not failed to visit uh, you know, some of these uh, Adivasi groups and learn a bit more but I don't have unfortunately the opportunity to conduct a you know, very detailed anthropological study on such groups of people but uh, I'm hoping that I can at least uh, try to you know uh, stimulate interest in, in this and and this is one of the areas that you know, I want to, in the long term, you know, see the establishment of a tribal uh, re you know, research centre uh, where there will be more information about the groups, more understanding about their ways of life and, and also um, you know, how developments, mining and you know, various other kinds of transformations are impacting on their lives. And, and I think it's important to have such you know, job very good documentation of how their lives have been transformed as a result of these various interventions in their you know, everyday lives. So uh, in particular, I'm, I would like to see more work on you know, uh, connections between tribal people and their environments, uh, their environmental knowledge, indigenous knowledge in general. I'd like to see more work on how you know, various kinds of state developmental projects uh, you know, displacing them or affecting them adversely, or uh, even if there are positive uh, benefits, and I'd like to know a bit more about what these benefits are. Um, and you know, one of the things that I found quite recently was um, when I, you know, 
visited a number of tribal groups. Like, do you know that, for example, you know there was a time where uh, tribal, various tribal communities would come together and, and have a kind of a, a meeting. It's it's almost like a tribal uh, parliament, and this okay. was. Um, it's in an area that evidently now is um, a rubbish dump. This is? In some somewhere in, 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 Goa. in Goa. So I, I was just told this recently and I think it would be good to get someone to actually research those sorts of things and see, you know, to, uh, to have a better appreciation and understanding of the kinds of indigenous forms of, you know, Organization. Ne negotiation, you know, yeah. dispute, um, you know. Coping mechanisms, yeah. yeah sort of resolution of disputes and you know um, and those sorts of various uh, yeah. kinds of political you know yeah. traditional political yeah. forms yeah. and I think it'd be thanks and yeah. all the best for it. yeah